welcome to this medi classes lecture series on uh, delayed puberty in girls and this is part of our initiative a monthly initiative in which we propose to cover the entirety of pediatric endocrinologist endocrinology from a pediatrician and pediatric uh, trainee perspective over the next 36 months uh, i am uh, pleased to be joined by uh, dr vibha who is a consultant in pediatric endocrinology at uh, regency uh, health and dr dhwani who is a fellow with us at Regency Center for Diabetes, Endocrinology and uh, Research. So this is a very, very important topic. And uh, what are the key things, uh, Dr. Vibha, you have to understand in terms of when you are evaluating a girl with delayed puberty uh, compared to boys with delayed puberty? Uh, so most, uh, in compared to the boys, the, the presentation and the cause of the delayed puberty in girls is mostly physiological. Uh, is not physiological in comparison to boys. So we have to uh, firstly rule out the systematic co systemic causes and uh, other pathogenic causes or the organic causes in comparison to boys. So although we have got lesser number of girls who come to us with delayed puberty, we need to be more worried about that in that perspective. So Adhwani, in your experience, what are the common presentations or common causes of delayed puberty of girls? <clears throat> So uh, again, as ma'am has mentioned that uh, when you have a girl with delayed puberty, you have to be wary of uh, it being a pathological cause. However, we've seen that about one third of these children are actually physiological and self-limited uh, delay of puberty. Uh, however, the most common causes that we encounter are probably uh, hypothyroidism, uh, Turner syndrome that we commonly see in our day-to-day uh, -day clinical practice. So celiac, hypothyroidism, Turner syndrome, these will be a very, very common. So we have this 13-year-old girl who had presented to us a few years ago with concern for delayed puberty. She had stage 1 breast development and stage 1 pubic hair development. So parents were concerned that she was not having puberty. She was short for the age, weight was reasonable. And somebody had in a workup which showed a low level of LH and FSH. To compound the matter further... A ultrasound had been done by the referring uh, physician who found a absent uterus. Now, this was a very devastating scenario for the parents. They were very concerned about the puberty, breast not being there, and ultrasound showing an absent uterus, which was an entirely disastrous scenario from that regards. But what we need to understand is that 13 years is just the edge in terms of the time when puberty should happen. And in this scenario, clearly we need to understand that when the breast is developing, the uterus will take time to develop. And at breast stage 1, we can often miss a uterus on a transabdominal scan. So this case really highlights the importance of not doing unnecessary workup like ultrasound and this case better would have been to wait and watch and this is what we did and the girl had a normal outcome subsequently. The second scenario was a 14 year old girl with delayed puberty. Now this is from a different perspective and dynamics. She had presented with stage 2 development with pubic hair stage 3. So what looked like that she had some development to begin with, this is what the parents said, and then the development had stopped for the last year or so. Again, the same thing was found, LH was 0.1 and FSH was 0.1, and people thought that, okay, like the first case, better to wait and watch, this was labeled as constitutional delay. Now, as I'll talk subsequently, that when somebody has a stalled puberty, it has got an entirely different connotation as compared to a classical case of delayed puberty in girls. And in this case, we should be worried about our underlying cause, which was missed. And she presented later with seizures and glioma. So there seems to be a quick balance with regards to not doing unnecessary workup in delayed puberty on the one hand, like in the first case, but also to not miss a cause which is very important. This is what we'll try to focus over the next hour or so is to develop clinical pointers to suggest pathology and do a reasonable amount of workup without overdoing it to identify the cause from that perspective. Now, delayed puberty, as we discussed, is common in girls. Approximately 2.5% of all girls have delayed puberty. As Dhani was talking about, 30% to 40% may be physiological, but we can have other pathologies like hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, less common, as compared to boys, functional causes like malnutrition, systemic illnesses more common in girls compared to boys. And of course, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with Turner syndrome leading the list is definitely common in that regards. So our role is to not unduly investigate these 30 to 40 percent with physiological causes, but not miss these 60, 70 percent who have a pathological cause in that regards. 
all of you should go and have a look at our website learning.growsociety.in which has got a lot of uh, resources with related to pediatric endocrinology including a number of video lectures which are available and courses in terms of that we have our e-learning platform on youtube which has got uh, a large number of videos as well and uh, we have got validated uh, courses in terms of pediatric endocrinology including a full hybrid fellowship program of a two-year program specific pediatric endocrinology course for postgraduates which is also available we have got a full spectrum of books ranging from pediatric endocrinology protocols which guide the pediatricians and pediatric trainees for basic workup to basic pediatric endocrinology which is covering pathophysiology as well and advanced pediatric endocrinology covering the entirety of pediatric endocrinology our mobile application which i'll touch base later is uh, one uh, tool which helps in terms of point of care management in that perspective so today we're going to focus on delayed puberty in girls we already recently had series on precautious puberty in boys and girls that's available as part of our youtube channel and you can go and have a look at it i am joined as discussed by dr vibha and uh, dr dhwani who will be focusing uh, about different aspects of delayed puberty evaluation from that regards. Now, hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis is the crux in terms of pubertal development. So, we've got the GnRH, which is produced by the hypothalamus, which is the trigger of puberty. This GnRH is under the stimulatory and inhibitory signals. So, the signals glutamate and kispeptin stimulate and GABA and MKRN3 suppress the pubertal development. Variations which happen in terms of these uh, have a outcome effect in terms of pubertal development. Now this GnRH, once we have got enough time and the body is mature, the inhibitory signals go off, goes to the pituitary to produce two important gonadotropins, the LH, which acts on the LH receptor in the theca cell to produce androsinidione and which is subsequently aromatized under the effect of FSH in the granulosa cell to estrogen. Estrogen is responsible through its action on the estrogen receptor 1, ES1 and ES2 in terms of the breast development, the bone growth maturation as well as the uterine growth. Importantly, adrenals produce DHEAs, which is the source of androgens and are largely responsible for pubic hair development in girls. And this makes pubic hair an important discriminatory factor in terms of etiology of delayed puberty. The adipocytes are an important source of regulation of puberty and only if the adipocytes are sufficient, which is indicated by a level of leptin, would the body pass the toll gate of puberty? So if you have a child who is malnourished, who has got low amount of adipose tissue, less amount of leptin, the puberty will not start. And if it started, it will stop at that point. And therefore, malnutrition and systemic illnesses are important causes of delayed puberty in girls from that perspective. So this is how the leptin works. Now, when we assess puberty, we need to understand that we have to assess breast and pubic hair development separately. And then when we combine them, we get a clear idea in terms of the accurate picture of the clinical scenario. So we all are aware about the different stages of breast development. We know that breast stage 2 is the one which starts the puberty. That's the papillary elevation. We have to distinguish it from lipomastia because that could be because of obesity. So you approximate your thumb and finger and look for the resistance. If there is resistance, there is a breast tissue. Otherwise, this is suggestive of a fat tissue. This is the point where the growth spurt happens. And if you have delayed puberty, you do not have a growth spurt. And therefore, the girls will be short. Breast stage 3 and 4 mean that you're coming close to menarche. And typically, there is a 2 to 2 and a half year gap between the thelarchy and menarche. If the gap is increased also by beyond three to four years, that is an indicator of a stalled puberty. And from a clinician perspective, I am worried about delayed puberty, but I am doubly worried in terms of a stalled puberty. So if I had a girl like in the case two, had some development to begin with, and then the development stops, that's an even major cause of concern in that perspective. Now, pubic hair do give a lot of clue in terms of diagnosis because they come from a different organ altogether, the adrenals. So what we are really looking at is not really P2, which is just bigger than vellus hair, short, straight and light. We are mainly worried about whether the P3 has developed or not. And if there is a discordance between the pubic hair 
and the breast development that really gives us a clue in terms of the diagnosis. So P3 means basically that you have got longer, thicker, curly and pigmented hair, which means definite androgen exposure has happened. And then you go from the subsequent breast uh, pubic hair development in that perspective and regards. Now, come, now, if we now look at in that perspective of the pubertal development overall, we now understand that there is a differential regulation which happens in terms of our breast development and in terms of the, pubert the pubic hair development. And this has implications in terms of how we should proceed in terms of evaluation and management. So the ovaries under the influence of LH and FSH, as we have discussed, produce estradiol, which is responsible for the breast and the uterine growth. On the other hand, adrenal under the influence of ACTH produces DHEAS, which regulates the pubic hair growth. So depending upon your disorder, you will have differential expression of telarchy and pubarchy. So four conditions, constitutional delay of puberty and growth, systemic illnesses, of course, this will be having an effect both on estradiol production and DHEAS production. If somebody has a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, they cannot produce ACTH, the DHEAS will be less. And if there is a steroidogenic defect, this is a rare scenario, will have both absent breast development and absence pubarchy. So absence of pubarchy in a girl with delayed puberty points predominantly to constitutional delay of puberty and growth or systemic illness. Likelihood of MPHD and steroidogenic defect is already there also in that regards. However, if there is an isolated hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, a GNRH deficiency, the ovaries are not working, but the adrenals are doing fine. So in this scenario, you will have a normal pubic hair development. So pubic hair development... So pubic hair development Uh, apologies for the disconnection. So pubic hair development, we're discussing about the correlates with regards to the pubic hair development and the breast development. And in this scenario, if we look at the overall correlate, as we discussed already, that you have got differential regulation as terms of ovaries and the uterine development and the breast development, which is regulated via the ovaries and the adrenals are regulating the pubic hair growth. So in scenarios where you have got defect affecting both of them in the form of constitutional delay of puberty and growth, systemic illness, multiple pituitary hormone deficiency and steroidogenic defects, there would be an effect of both ovaries as well as adrenals. There will be no breast development and no pubic hair development. However, in scenarios where you have a specific problem with regards to However, if you have a specific problem which is affecting the GnRH neuron, in that scenario, you will have a problem of uh, the effect will predominantly be on the ovarian production. There would not be an effect in terms of adrenal production and there will be a normal pubarchy. So if there is no breast development but pubarchy is present, you are thinking more in terms of a GnRH deficiency. If there is a problem in which the estrogen is being produced from aromatization of the androgen, but the androgens are not acting, the individual will have typically a good breast development, but the pubic hair development will be sparse. So this differential of breast development, but not having pubic hair development is a typical scenario of androgen insensitivity. And finally, if there is nothing wrong in terms of the ovarian function or in terms of the adrenal function, there may be a normal amount of breast development and normal amount of uterine development. So there will be normal breast, normal pubic hair, but because there is a Mullerian agenesis or there is an obstruction, there would be no periods in that regard. So that would be a malformation. So no breast, no pubic hair is suggestive of a constitutional delay of puberty and growth, systemic illness or MPHD. 
if there is pubic hair but no breast development that's GnRH deficiency if there is breast but no pubic hair that's androgen insensitivity if there are breast and pubic hair but there is no vaginal bleeding that suggests a uterine malformation in that perspective now the hormonal progression typically is that the FSH levels are usually higher in the prepubertal age group but the LH level increases by around 10 times more as compared to FSH levels so LH is a much better indicator as far as the pubertal development is concerned. You need to remember that as time progresses, the bioactive to immunoreactive uh, ratio will also be more in that regard. Now, growth of pelvic organ is also very important. And if you notice that at breast stage one, the uterine volume is very, very small. It's like a paper thin structure. It's a straight tubular structure. As the breast grows, the estrogen levels goes. It changes into a globular structure from tubular to globular. The length increases and the volume increases in that perspective. So what we need to understand clearly is that if there is no breast development, the uterine development may also be defective in that perspective and that's an important cause of concern. So now in this perspective of the hypothalamic, pituitary, gonadal axis, we can understand the pathophysiology of delayed puberty. Problems could be at the level of the hypothalamus, which is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, characterized by low levels of LH and FSH. Or the problem could be at the level of ovaries where the FSH levels will be high. This is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism typically can be because of a physiological cause, 20 to 30 percent cases, a genetic cause, a trauma or any form of insult or infiltration including tumor. So any girl who has delayed puberty with low LH and FSH, we have to really worry about pathological causes once we have excluded the systemic illness, CDGP and the other basic causes like functional disorders. Hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, the most common cause is gonadal dysgenesis in the setting of Turner syndrome. And in this regard, we also have to think of steroidogenic defect here, a karyotype becomes.